Hello, everyone. We welcome you today at the America House. Uh, I'm representing ICU here for Alumni Association, and we are conducting a series of lectures aimed at career development. And if uh, if you look at your careers, uh, nowadays presentation skills are one of the most crucial skills um, for, uh, for us to develop. That's why we are excited uh, to invite uh, an expert uh, of presentations, Luke Shinye, uh, who has been doing presentations for more than 15 years professionally, winning tough clients and um, winning tough projects and executing them. So uh, I am glad for you and I hope you will enjoy today uh, Luke's uh, insights on how to do uh, on his art of the presentation. Please welcome Luke Shinya. Okay, um, what I tell everybody, usually I do have a presentation but I never know what I'm gonna say. It usually depends on the mood and what we're going to do. As the team was saying, I've been in Ukraine for 16 years on and off. So I've seen it all, done it all, I've been to too many revolutions. And now, and I've seen what a good presentation can make and how it can fail also very, very well. The, how did I start into, into presentations? Um, if you take a look at presentations in general, we make presentations every single day. It's not just doing the PowerPoints that nobody likes to do, nobody likes to see. Nobody enjoys the whole process in general. The issue is we make presentations all the time. If you go on a date, you're making a presentation. You're trying to sell yourself. You go see a job employer, you're making a presentation again. If you go in front of a big crowd, line up, which is fun, <laughs> then you, you're still making a presentation. And short presentations are all around us. And how do we do them? We just don't realize because we put them directly on the screen. So if I talk too fast, it's the French side of me. So I love to speak and I speak quite fast. So I'll try and slow down or maybe you can tell me to slow it down if you want to. So I, had, I was told I need to stand in between these two here. Um, let's get started in general. So my background in general is in advertising, Canadian born from Montreal. I came to Ukraine. I've been, I've been doing this for around 20 plus years. Advertising, I came here in beginning of year 2000 when PF Star was just a small company with about 10,000 subscribers that they had on them. And then a Frenchuk, now Pinchuk, was my client, and it was three people in a room. So that was quite interesting. Fozy Group was another one where they had one store. Now you see Sipo, Fora, you see everything. Did that, went to Moscow. I'm just giving you an overall encompassing of what it is. Went to Moscow, worked for J. Walter Thompson for the entire region as their creative director, launched Mazda in Russia, worked with Rolex, Lipton, blah, blah, blah. A lot of big clients, but a lot of experience. Managed to be at the Orange Revolution when my daughter wasn't born yet in front of the Ukraine, in front of the embassy of Ukraine, and we were probably outgunned by 500 police officers to 30 people, and I was a strange Canadian guy that was there filming it all for everybody. Um, in short, I came back to Ukraine, had my own agency, worked with MTV, went to work for PokerStars uh, globally as a global creative director and strategy. But time and time again, what I saw, but it took me literally 15 plus years to realize there were so many companies that I worked with that spent millions, sometimes hundreds of millions, into building a great brand only to fail absolutely miserably when they would come to presenting it to the public or when they would come to showing shareholders investors on how that they had to show it. It was, it's like that they gave up and they just went to sleep. And that people were just not inspired and they didn't like it. I saw in Montreal at that time, I saw a young woman who was doing PowerPoints and she said, hi, my name is Sophie something. And she was professional in doing presentations for ad agencies because it's a huge amount of resources, a huge amount of time to build it. And she figured out there's a great niche and there's a lot of she thought there was a lot of money into doing the way she was doing was not very prof not professional but not very profitable in that time but it caught on to me and i said wait a minute there's something that everyone uses it's all around us but yet nobody you know powerpoints everywhere and we're not going to talk only about powerpoint but i'm focusing on because it's probably 90 percent of you is what you're using in general you can push that into 
You can push that basically into film, which is what we do quite a bit of titanium. Like maybe you've seen the Ukraine Open for You with Anuka, who's playing tonight. Uh, Okianelzi, we did the tours and videos. They're playing around the world, so that's some of the work that we've done. Some of them is um, Prezi, some other ones is PowerPoint, some other times it's digital for Richard Branson. So there's a lot of different types of presentations, but I'm going to focus more on the general one, the basic, which is PowerPoint. But you can then expand that very easily into different types of presentations. So what did I put on this? So it's like I say, if a picture is worth a thousand words, imagine what a great presentation can actually say. I'm going to back up a bit. And again, I told you I never know what I'm going to say because it just comes out. But I had a client who came to me and said, okay, look, I really need a great presentation. I'm meeting in front of my shareholders. There's going to be a thousand people in London. And I'm flying out for this specifically. And I got to look like Steve Jobs. So first of all, you're not Steve Jobs, you're selling chemicals, but that's okay. So let's take it from there. So I gave him the bill, and I'll say very openly, I said, okay, I'll make up a number. I said, it's around 8,000 euros for your presentation. Are you crazy? A lot of expletive words that came out. Who the hell do you think you are? Charge me as much. My secretary can do this. I said, okay, that makes me feel much better that your secretary can do it, but you're calling me in, but that's okay. So I said, tell you what, you're a financial guy, so let's talk about the cost of what it costs you to do it. So I took a piece of paper and I said, what's your salary, roughly? I said, looking at the size of your company, started jotting down, we're probably looking at three, four hundred, quarter million a year plus bonuses. This is a very large company. Wrote it down. I said, how many hours do you spend? So once we started looking at the amount of hours, I said, you said, oh, maybe 30. I said, I said, it's around 40 to 50 hours, nights, weekends, not with your kids, not when you're not in board meetings, when you're doing your actual job, you need to prepare for this. So I put 40. Then I said, once you got that done, wasting your weekends, your time with your family and the whole bit, now let's see what happens out there. You probably give it to your marketing team. He goes, yeah, three people, I'm sure. He goes, absolutely. So they'll spend another 20 hours because they really want to impress the boss, but they're losing their time from doing their job. So I put their salary, I started calculating everything. And I said, you're probably going to spend another five hours telling them what you don't like and what you do like. He said, okay. So I put a line in between. Then I said, now let's take all those hours that you should have been doing your job. You should have been selling more chemicals. You should have been, your marketing team should have been out there making profits for your shareholders. I finished that up. In the end, we finished at close to $68,700. And he said, and I said, you think that, you're, that my $8,000 is a ripoff? And just winked at me, he says, give me the pen, and he signed it, and he says, get out of here. <laughs> so, so then we got, and he's been one of my best clients now since then. Just telling you that there is a value when you do it right, but some people just tend to not understand the value of a good presentation, what it brings you, but what it can lose you also if you're not doing it the right way. So imagine what a great presentation can actually deliver. So now we're going to get into the dirty part. Word. What is Word. Word is a reading document. A lot of people like taking their word, they'll copy paste and they'll put that into their PowerPoint. And they feel that, okay, I'll just put that, I'll stick it into my PowerPoint, and there you go, I'm done. Wrong. Word is made for reading. PowerPoint is made for presenting. Presenting, I quote again another good client who said, I want very little words, one click, I am the star, Luke, not the presentation. And I said, hallelujah, finally somebody who understands. When you're looking at Steve Jobs, I'm just putting it as an example because it's a frame of reference for everybody. What do you concentrate on? Do you concentrate on the screen or do you concentrate on him? It's always on him. Very little do you concentrate. It's always three words, two words, one big picture. So presenting is an art form. It's about talking, like what I'm doing right now. It's having a conversation with people. Sometimes I jump back and forth on my slides, so don't jump too much, but I absolutely detest when I see somebody standing behind a podium and just talking. It's like, almost like, what is this? The government seal of a country talking, I'm not too, too sure. There's another, you got in. So, so it's like I said, we present all the time, as I was saying at the beginning. The, the overall part is, like I said, you present in your board meetings, in new business ventures, in front of people when you're making a speech. We present everywhere where we are. You just don't realize it. There was a really good movie that, it's a very underground flick, but I liked it. It's about 10, 15 years old called Boiler Room. 
if you haven't seen it, Boiler Room, great movie. It's all about stocks and underground stocks and all that. And Ben Affleck, when he was much younger, says in there, and he's hiring recruits of young guys that are going to be calling, selling stocks, you know, ripping off people. It's called a boiler room. And he said a sale is made on every single phone call you make. Either you sell them why they need to buy our stock, or they sell you why they don't want to buy your stock. One way or another, somebody's making a sale. Who's it going to be? And that's the same thing as this. So I can make a nice presentation to a client, but that person is probably saying, I don't want to buy from this person, or you're going to convince them why you're buying. One way or another, presentation is going to make a sale. It depends, are you going to be the winner? This, this is always a fun little slide. If you take a look at the, um, in general, at the statistics of people, they take a look at what people are most afraid about in life. And what's kind of funny is that people are less afraid of death than they are of speaking to a group. <laughs> Which is, they'd rather die than actually go up on stage with people. I still remember myself, and again, I told you, I go back and forth on stories. My first ever speech when I was well, probably four or five years old, I was just starting in school. There's a big crowd which felt like a million people, but there was maybe a couple of hundred people at the school, and I had to get a girl to come and sit down beside me because I had to tell, recite a poem or something in front of the whole school. I was shaken so hard, apparently, that the entire the entire school was just laughing so hard. So that was my introductory to, to, to public speaking, and I never did it until I graduated from university. So it took me a long time to get over that fear, and I remember I would start making a speech. I would prepare for three, four months. Now, sometimes I can go up with no slides at all, and I'll just have a conversation, because I realize people are not there to see you fail. People are there because they're genuinely interested in what you have to talk about. So you need to get that feel, oh, but what if I screw up? Like my daughter, she's 11 years old, and I constantly put her as many times as I can. I put her in the video with Okie and Elsie. She's in there. I said, I don't want to do it. I said, do it. You know, now you go, because I'm trying to get this out of her system that she's comfortable in speaking in front of people. It's a very important trait. It's the same thing. So you can make a nice PowerPoint. You can make a presentation, but you also have to present yourself in a very big way. And that's 80% of the sale is made in how you communicate with the people. Motion creates emotion. You gotta move. That's why I don't like a podium. You gotta get it exciting, basically. You got, don't be afraid to talk about a personal joke. Start singing if you have to. They didn't want to let me do karaoke today because we have two hours apparently, but I don't know if I'll get past one hour on this speech because usually it's a 45 minute speech, but. So create, motion creates emotion. Don't be so monotone. Don't be afraid to laugh. Laugh at yourself. Have some fun, basically. This is, I, I view this, it's like going out before having a coffee with somebody. One person, 200 people, 1,000 people. To me, it's all the same. Actually, it gets easier. The more people you have, the easier it gets because you can't really focus on anybody. It's just a bunch of heads, and it's a lot easier to basically do. So, so be the presentation. What's on your, as I was saying, sometimes I jump a bit back and forth, but the, you have to be the presentation. You have to sell it. It's, I was just reading it last night on uh, Inc. Magazine. It's one of my favorite business magazines that I read religiously every day, five, six articles. And it was, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Reddit. It's like one of those online, it's quite big. And the guys were saying that they came up with this website originally. It was called, mm, it was like lots of M's on, and they got destroyed in the meeting. But the investor said, we didn't want to buy into this website. We wanted to buy into you because we fell in love with how you guys were presenting yourself. Come up with some great ideas and we're ready to invest in you. And that's true and that's a big way. So a lot of people most times, I've sold stuff that I never should have sold. But for some reason, clients said, I remember we won once a really good, uh, really good account. And I said, great, okay, you won the pitch. Very good money, everybody was happy, everyone's celebrating. So we come back to the board meeting two weeks later. We said, great, so how do we get begin on our creative? I said, oh, the creative was horrible. They said, we like you. So now let's start over from, from zero. So you'd be surprised how you can win, even though what you presented wasn't all that great, but it's you. So that's 80, 90% of the sale is made in that way. You'll notice I talk about sale quite often because that's the way it is. This is probably a really good formula that everyone needs to, to think about. So mystery equals curiosity equals discovery. I use this in advertising, I use this in my presentations, I use this everywhere consistently. It's pure human psychology. 
on how that you deal with it. One, you need to create a mystery. The mystery is what's going on there. But what creates from mystery ignites curiosity. The more the more mystery there is, the more curiosity you want to find out. The more mystery, the more curiosity you find, boom, the discovery comes in. And the discovery hits you deep inside, and it's your way because you discovered it on your own, not somebody telling you word for word, not a monologue, but it's a way that you discover it individually. If you can discover it yourself, it's much more impactful in that way, and it'll stay, and then the sale is much. So when you're doing a very good presentation, what's the mystery that you're doing at the beginning? How are you getting people to pose questions, to want to learn? I'm not saying what I'm doing today is a mystery, because we already know the mystery is the art of the presentation. But how are you going to start it off? What I really detest is when I see in, and everybody does it, you start your presentation and what happens? Hello and welcome to the introductory of a clicker. Today we have seven different bullet points from chapter one to chapter seven. We're now going to start and we're gonna do this. Chapter one, people go, okay, chapter one, they listen to it. 20 minutes later, oh my God, this person is putting me to sleep. How am I gonna get, and there's still six more chapters to go. Please, good God, kill me now. Oh, my telephone's ringing. I have to go, I have to go to the bathroom, please. Any excuse, has anybody ever been in one of those meetings yeah. That you, that you, have you ever tried? I've gotten pretty darn close at it, but I, I, I think they caught on at the boardroom that I tried to sleep with my eyes open. I know I did. Uh, I know it's possible. No, everything is blurry. I don't see. But you look like you're high on drugs. It's what you don't realize, but that's the reality of it. So you have to keep the people engaged into the meeting. Don't put the table of contents. Please don't do this because this is just, there's no mystery. We already know. It's like saying, here's a book. And chapter one to that, and you're saying everything like, the person is lost in the forest, the person is found decapitated somewhere. At the end, you already know what's gonna happen by chapter 10, so don't do it. So keep them engaged and do the, the story flow. Am I doing okay with this camera, or am I just jumping too much in the middle? Yes, it's fine. <laughs> this is my favorite little slide, by the way, the next one after. People's attitudes when they're looking at this, um, when they're looking at a, at, a, at a presentation, they have a tendency to look at the screen. It's what I said, you don't want to take like the word and pour a whole pile of text on it, because guess what happens? Everyone is reading while the person is talking. But what happens after that is people are reading, they're not paying attention to a person. The brain can't function with two things going on at once. So when you want people to start listening, something very, very important to what you have to say, and not to look at the picture, not to look at the graphs, you put nothing. And it forces people to come and look at you. <laughs> it's a dirty, it's the most simplistic form, but they're forced. Now the eyes go back to you. Trust me, it, it sells very, very well. Somebody told me this once, and I tried it, and it's brilliant. I mean, all of a sudden, all you see, 500 heads, and they all turn and give it to you. And that's the cheapest slide I've ever seen. But that's, I'm thinking about copywriting this, but I can't yet. So, Blank slide, focus comes back onto you, especially if you want to talk about something meaningful, and this is very, very important into your presentation. Unless you want to show it with something, this is the way to bring the focus back to say, this is gonna be important, watch me, and listen to me carefully, and then you can go on to your next slides and continue talking, but the focus has come back. Avoid the podium. I'm sorry, but this is not um, meet the press or where they're meeting behind with a big emblem because there's usually a reason for that. Avoid the podium. If you've noticed, like I take a look at, I mean, I'm putting people that everyone recognizes, but take a look at Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> this person, as I said, be the presentation. The podium is usually a safeguard where people love to go and they like hiding behind because it makes them feel like they can do it or it's there. Me, I usually tell them when I usually make speeches, I say, get rid of this thing. I don't want to see it on stage. I want to push it away completely into the side. So avoid the podium, become the presentation, become the star. Now, you might say, but what happens, Luke, if there's, if there's only we're around a boardroom table? Same thing. Do you need to sit at the boardroom table and talk? Go in a circle like this. No, walk around the room. Own the room. Control the room. People say that I'm overbearing when I do meetings. But I'll see a big CEO, I'll see the financial. By the way, one little trick, if ever you're doing a really, like a big sales pitch, 
don't concentrate on the CEO. Make him feel like he or she is a rock star, but concentrate on the CFO. That's the person you, <laughs> that'll pay for all your money. They'll give you the money and they'll do. CFO, CEO, pat his hair and he feels like a star. Make sure the CFO feels great. You put that person, they'll influence the CEO. Done deal, the contracts are getting signed much faster. Um, but again, walk around the room and talk about it. Again, motion creates emotion is what I'm saying. Don't sit at your table, your comfort zone, because then guess what happens? Everyone is sitting. People start playing on their mobile phones. People try to fall asleep with their eyes open, as I was saying, and that's what's going on. Walk around the room. It forces them to get engaged and forces people to pay attention to who you are. Man, the guy Luke is just walking all over the place. He thinks he owns the room. You're damn right I own the room. This is my room. It's my presentation. Treat it like you own it, is what I say. But you can't speak like a little mouse when you're walking around the room. Damn it, this is my room, and I'm going to no, I'm exaggerating. I'm not that North American. So. <laughs> See? Look at that. Nice and red. No, because I do some other speeches as well for uh, advertising. <clears throat> that. So connect to the room of the temper. You know, connect to the temperature of the room. Now, what does that mean? You can practice all you want making a speech, preparing a presentation. I've done tons of these things. That's not me over there. That's one of my clients. The problem is, is that you can practice, practice. I almost don't practice because I was reading a great quote, again, by Steve Jobs the other day. If you know what you're talking about, you don't need a PowerPoint. I could pretty much make this speech without even having a PowerPoint presentation. I could just speak, and it's a lot easier. I was just talking to the, to the team that invited me. I was looking at all my old report cards when I was a little kid. Luke talks too much, Luke talks too much, Luke is a class clown, Luke can't stop moving around the class. It's like nonstop for like eight years in a row. And I was telling my teacher that I met at Christmas when I was back in Montreal. I said, you remember how I was? She goes, oh, you were horrible. You were one of the worst in the class. You wouldn't talk. They actually threatened. Back then, they could do it. But now, they actually threatened to tie me up at one part in the class. But now I do it for a living. I sell. My mouth is my best weapon. And that's the main issue. But confidence as well. So you got to connect to the room in the to the temperature in the room, why? Because you can practice all you want, but you can walk into a room, and I know all of you have experienced this. The CEO got into a fight with his wife that morning, or vice versa, the husband didn't, didn't do with their job, they're in a rotten mood. It's raining outside, everyone is crampy, they're in a bad mood. Uh, you walk in, and you, you're sure that it's going to kill them. You know, like, it's gonna be amazing. Everyone's like this. There's absolutely no reaction in the room. And then you start losing, okay, my God, how do I get them back into it? It's, you need to adjust very quickly to the room. If it's quiet, unquiet them. You need to figure out how to get it done, but you need to find that one person also in the room. You can't just rummage right through, like trailblaze right through your presentation as you were doing. If it's not working, shift gears and go into slightly or change the conversation. Start making a story of like when I was a young boy, I didn't plan this today. I just like sometimes mixing it up where I could just go slide by slide. Pretty boring. This presentation would be done in five minutes. You know, so that's the way that we would do it. So you need to connect to the room in the temperature. Now, the way you connect to the room in the temperature is you need to find your allies. Your allies is a big one. So what I do is she's got a nice smile. She's like, she looks like she's interested, like she's actually paying attention. Great, that's the one person. The person in the back who looks like, well, maybe she likes the color of my suit today. That's cool, I like it. And then I look completely in the back and I see another person that looks like they're quite interested because they're, they're giving me the little nod, you know. It's either that or they're just trying to fall asleep and they don't want anybody <laughs> to know. So the point is, is that you gotta figure out one, two, three, and four. Why? Because that way, all of that group thinks that I give a damn about them, but really I'm talking to one person. Number one here, I'm bringing something very close. Looks like there's rapport. Back, maybe coffee later. And then I'm doing, and then maybe this person will give me a business card later. But it gives me ample room to move across the room. Now, what do you do when you only have five people in a room? Pick two people. If you pick only to one, the other ones will get jealous. They'll feel insulted. Why is he looking? Why is he always talking to this person? Why is he sucking to the to the CEO, I'm telling you, CFO, 
That's the person who writes you your checks. So you got to be nice to that person. So anyways, pick your allies. Fix to the room, the temperature of the room. There's going to be some people. There will be one person in the back who's doing this. It's fine. They're having dreams about you. That's what I say. That's my way of acting. They're dreaming. You're so amazing that they want you in their subconscious. You know? They're meditating all that great information. So find your allies, guys. This is the biggest issue. Once you find your allies, you connect to the room and to the temperature of the room. Again, it's not a foolproof formula. It's just the way that I do it, but it works well. The big issue is that it's not a big issue, but it's so many people they don't connect to the room temperature. They just ram they just ram that information down down your throats, and that's why people are saying, "How can I fall asleep with my eyes open?" This you know, how can I need to go to the bathroom? I got an emergency. Next thing you know, they disappear for twenty minutes. They come back. So what did I miss? Well, we're done. You'll have to. Email that to me, you know, like that. This will be great. You remember what I said about the um, word, right? Copy and paste. I see this consistently. Do not read. Look at this guy. He's reading. Everyone else is reading. Guess what? This is like reading a book. But you know, you know when there's those books, but they have those audio books for people who are too lazy to read? That's pretty much what this is all about. We need to stop copy and pasting, and I'm going to get into how much words that you should have on your screen, what you should be doing. Never do this kind of stuff because this is this pretty much shows that you don't know what the hell you're talking about. You're just copy and pasting, and you're reading to everyone because they're they're too stupid to read. So you need to dictate to them. And a lot of people are doing this. Is what puts. So imagine if a person says, "We have today. We are table of contents." Remember what I said at the beginning? There are seven chapters. And then a person sees on the bottom, it says slide eight of 250. Oh my God, just put a pen in my eye right now. And I can't go with this anymore. Oh, sorry, I'm wearing sunglasses today. Yes, why? Well, because, you know, I've got an allergy. I was out last night. I need to put this on. The person's really sleeping behind the sunglasses. Then the, actually, that's my secret. So that's, see, I've got a pair of sunglasses right over there. So they're ready for that. So. It's usually what I think. When I see somebody with sunglasses, they're either too cool or they're just sleeping. One of the two. <laughs> it's like what I'm doing with you right now. Have a conversation. Don't monologue, please. Bring in true human behavior into your thing. Let them know who you are as a person. People are more apt to not falling asleep, to listening. They know you better. They trust you more. And it's much better to basically do that. So don't monologue. And now the next chapter, you will see on page 17 that is this and that. It's, I'm going to show you a couple of small videos. These videos are always fun to watch. It gives you a break from my monologuing. And I'm going to show you the, the thing is how I, how I act is that I like being brutally honest in all my – sometimes it's embarrassing, sometimes it's great, but they never forget who I am. When I go into a meeting – like I said, people want to believe. So I'm going to show you one. Be honest. The honesty is probably one of the best things. Bring stories like of my childhood. I didn't tell you. There's some really bad ones from my childhood I could have brought, but now we're kind of it's kind of a governmental place, so I'm not allowed to speak to that word. Um, but I'm going to show you how a presentation can sell just by using personal stories in a very big way. People like it because it's more believable when you're talking about something that really matters to you inside and you're bringing it in into the sales pitch. So let's... This is Joe Harriman, Lynn Taylor. No Eastmans today, unfortunately. They're all back in the lab. It's a wonderful facility, but they don't take vacations. What do they show? Slides have been working? <laughs> so have you figured out a way to work the wheel into it? We know it's hard because wheels aren't really seen as exciting technology, even though they are the original. Well, technology is a glittering lure, but uh, there's a rare occasion when the public can be engaged on a level beyond flash if they have a sentimental bond with the product. My first job, I was in-house at a fur company with this old pro copywriter, Greek, named Teddy. And Teddy told me the most important idea in advertising is new. It creates an itch. You simply put your product in there as a kind of calamine lotion. 
He also talked about a deeper bond with the product. Nostalgia. It's delicate. But potent. Sweetheart. Teddy told me that in Greek, nostalgia literally means the pain from an old wound. It's a twinge in your heart, far more powerful than memory alone. This device isn't a spaceship. It's a time machine. Backwards, forwards. It takes us to a place where we ache to go again. It's not called the wheel, it's called the carousel. travel the way a child travels, round and around, back home again. To a place where we know we're loved. true story now anyone does anybody follow Mad Men or did yeah, great show by the way um, if you would have been following the show Don Draper who was a big creative guy um, just recently got divorced and now he's talking deeply from his heart but he still has good memories and the whole bit but he brought that raw emotion of what it is into that meeting just by showing what the mechanism could be brilliant presentation it's a TV show I know but still it's to the point pure honesty, raw emotions, and just the look on their face. I guarantee you this could have been in any ad agency. It's not just make-believe, it's real, because I've seen great presentations like this. So <laughs> if honesty comes out, bring that raw feeling that you have deep down inside and bring it into the presentation. People remember it and people want to buy into it in a very big way. So don't be afraid to change courses. As I said, you can prepare all you want, but it's like life. You cannot prepare for what's going to happen tomorrow. Nobody knows what the future is going to be. Nobody knows what, even in this presentation, I don't know what's going to happen. What if electricity goes out in this building? How do I continue doing this speech? I have to be able to deal with technical issues, and I have to be able to change courses very quickly, because if the temperature in the room, your allies all, all of a sudden aren't smiling, aren't nodding to you anymore, you got to switch very, very quickly. So mistakes will happen. As I was saying, people, oh, but what if I screw up? What if people are laughing at me? What if they're bored? What if they don't want to buy from me? Boo-hoo. Deal with it. It's called life. Mistakes will happen. How do you change courses? I'm going to show you one video because we're always talking about, oh, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, he's so perfect. He made it. He's got the big gullwing airlines and everything. He's doing everything. How do you fix when you're doing a live presentation in front of a lot of people and a big screw up happens? I guarantee you what I'm going to show you now wasn't reported in the news, didn't show it on the Mac, on the Mac site. So how do you fix it? You adjust to the room. If people love you already, they fell in, they like you, you're talking honestly and you're having a conversation, it's much easier than if you're just reading a script on your, on your PowerPoint and you don't know how to change because you haven't given that rapport with your allies or anybody. 
So let's watch a little video. Let's watch from the pro. That's what I like. At the introduction of the iPhone 4 on Monday, Apple CEO Steve Jobs found himself in an unfamiliar position, dealing with keynote tech problems. Our networks in here are always unpredictable, so I have no idea what we're going to do. That is the global launch, everybody. That's pretty they are big. slow today. The presentation of the new phone was dogged with problems, a result of the airwaves crowded with Wi-Fi signals. You know, you can help me out if you're on Wi-Fi, if you could just get off. <laughs> I appreciate it. Now, we're having a little problem here. I don't know what's wrong with our networks. When he couldn't get on Wi-Fi, one of the phones tried and failed to connect with AT&T's much-criticized 3G network. <laughs> There we go, yes, I know that. I don't want the cellular data network. Well, geez, I don't like this. After a few offline demos, the problem was clearer, but not yet fixed. Now, before I begin number six, I, uh, our guys were running around like crazy backstage, as you might imagine. <laughs> and we figured out why uh, my demo crashed. Because there are 570 Wi-Fi base stations operating in this room. Okay? We can't deal with that. So we have two choices. Either I've got some more demos that are really great that I'd like to show you. So we either turn off all the stuff and see the demos, or we give up and I don't show you the demos. Would you like to see the demos or not? <laughs> okay. So here's the deal. Let's turn up the lights in the hall. Several hundred of these are these MiFi things too, by the way. So all you bloggers need to turn off your base stations, turn off your Wi-Fi, every notebook, I'd like them to put, put them down on the floor, and all of you look around, I'd like you to police each other. <laughs> if you want to see the demos, shut all your laptops, turn off all these MiFi base stations, and put them on the floor, please. Come on, look around you. <laughs> at one point, there was light at the end of the tunnel, but when it came time for the most important demo of all, the problem returned. This never freezes up, so you guys haven't turned off all your Wi Fi. Come on, let's get it off, please. Hey, Johnny, how you doing? I'm good, I'm good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing okay, except for these guys that aren't turning their Wi-Fi off. With reporting by Steve Lawson in San Francisco, this is Martin Williams, IDG News Service. All right, now you know that this didn't show up in the press release after that, but if anyone knew or read about Steve Jobs, he was not a very nice person at work. He was an extremely aggressive person. I can only imagine how many people were fired or their heads were ripped off after for that. <laughs> but you can see how, I can even tell in his voice, <laughs> it's just he wants to kill somebody, but he keeps his composure, mistakes will happen, have some fun, turn it into a little bit of fun in a way. So, mistakes will happen, guys. Just don't worry about it. It's it's not the end of the world, it's just a PowerPoint that failed. You know, just keep going. So, 10 core questions, uh, and I'm going to bring a couple of examples from some clients that we've worked with. Most of these, six out of 10, I think, in here are from real life issues that happened to us in the company. We had quite a very good client, and there were so many mistakes by the supplier that we were hired to do the job to put the presentation in. But they said, no, no, we've got our own supplier. So, they'll do the video, they'll do the sound, they'll do everything. To the point that we started making our own list of things in, insisting to each client what had to be done. So what size is your screen arranged to fit the screen? I've seen so many people who put a four by three, which is a standard one, but then show up to do it at a movie theater where the screen is this big. So all you have is a tiny little screen in the middle. All it takes is a little click in your PowerPoint, 16.9, and now you got a nice big screen. So check where are you going to be doing this show and how are you going to do it? Like this one, technically this would be a 69. That's a four by three. So technically you could go even wider if you want to go. It's a simple little click in the beginning before doing it, but it can make a really nicer looking presentation for you. Once you do your presentation, it's hard to then go back to 69 because you have to re-import everything into that presentation. So what computer will be used? A Mac, 
or a PC. Why do I say this? I work on Mac, a lot of people do, a lot of people work on PCs. When I do my PowerPoint on a Mac and then I give it at the last second for a presentation to a PC, guess what happens? Sometimes some fonts, sometimes a letter goes to the next line, it readjusts, it happens quite often. Even if you're going to go from a Mac to a PC, please check a long time before and adjust to PC. I have two, three computers, I test on one, I test on the next. There's nothing worse than making a nice presentation to see the font is missing on a PC, and then it took this beautiful looking presentation and it converted it to Arial or to some Helvetica font, and all of a sudden because of that, it pushed a bold and it shoved it into a picture or a graph. It looks like you were drunk when you were doing your presentation, pretty much. So, and it's very, very simple, just check it out. What platform is going to be used? Number one question I ask every client, again, what are we, what will you be doing it in? Now, this is not for you. Maybe you're doing it for your boss. Maybe you're doing it for a client. A lot of clients, oh, I want that Prezi stuff. It's so awesome. <laughs> you know, it swings all over the place. And, you know, it's not going to be that boring stuff. Again, it's like a really good Hollywood movie. What is the content? What is the story that you're selling? And a lot of Hollywood movies, when they're very, the story, there is no story. Well, they put a lot of explosion, they put dinosaurs that are flipping into cars, and they do extended scenes where everything is getting destroyed for 45 minutes. Technically, a 10-minute movie lasts for two hours. It's the same thing with Prezi. Use it to your advantage. Why do you want to do it? How do you want to guide them through the story? 99% of the time, it's going to be PowerPoint. Why? Because changes will happen at the very last second. Your CEO doesn't know how to run a Prezi or a keynote by Mac because he doesn't have a Mac, he has a PC. You'd be surprised what you can do in PowerPoint. And no, I don't work for Microsoft. So I'm not trying to push that. But we've done stuff on PowerPoint that even Microsoft itself in Germany told us, how did you do that? And they said, can you teach us how to do that? I said, uh, uh, uh. That's, we, we found a back door into your system and we know how to do it. I said, if you want to give me some residuals, I'm ready to show you. But the PowerPoint is usually the best one because Especially if you think about in Ukraine right now, and you're doing a financial presentation. Your boss or your CFO is doing that. Um, we did one for a pharmaceutical company. I can't say their names, but this was last year, and this was when a lot of stuff was going on in Eastern and Donetsk in that area, and then another city had been taken over by some not nice people. And the Grivna was just jumping all over the place at that time, and literally within 30 to 40 minutes, the Grivna was going by $1, down $1, up, and this was changing everything for this pharmaceutical. And they had a 1,000 people showing up at this, and this they were showing the year-end results. We were changing at the very last seconds all the Grivna currencies, and it was changing all the graphs extremely, extremely fast. So I'm just saying you need to have the flexibility to change at the very last second. And while the Prezi might look wild, it's going to cause you, if we would have been in Prezi, there's no way we could have finished that at the very last second. So we had to do it. And sometimes a CEO doesn't want you to see the numbers. They won't only want to do it. So they need to be able to fix on the weekend by themselves. So while this is nice, you can still do something incredibly beautiful in that. So pick the right tools for the conversation, not try to dominate a conversation on special effects. It's not, that means you have nothing of concrete to talk about. This is a good one. So we're doing this huge presentation. Titanium is just starting at that time. I'm very proud of Finally, this is one of those big logos I wanted in there because the more big logos you have of corporations, the more people want to work with you because they say, wow, you work with so and so and so. You don't even have to show them what work you did. You just say, look, what we here's the people we work with. We're number one. That's It's very, it makes people feel good. So the CEO is now on stage. Everyone in a big amphitheater, they're talking, and the guy's talking, but for some reason, the screen goes black. And then all of a sudden, a few seconds, like, oh, comes back on. I kept doing that, on and off. And I could tell it was really irritating. And I'm like, what's going on here, you know? We found out that the supplier who had brought all the computer equipment and everything had forgot to take the sleep mode off of his computer. So therefore, it was going, the sleep mode was going on and off, on and off, and it was ruining, pretty much it ruined the overall experience what he was trying to do. It really wasn't professional. They blamed our PowerPoint. We had to give them a small course on how PowerPoint 
doesn't go to sleep mode on its own. It's a computer that does that. But still, the damage has been done. So please check if there's a sleep mode, take it off. Using the right projector, same conference again, same guy. Again, he's on stage, huge amphitheater, movie theater style, like Cinemax style. Guess what happens on this one? They had promised, the supplier had promised to bring the right resolution to really make it crystal clean. The last minute, the supplier says, ah, you know what, this is good enough, it's just a projector. It was nice, but it was all out of focus. So it was out of focus, the sleep mode was going on and off, and we had worked for two weeks, night and day, to get this done. So I was equally as disappointed on what just somebody who didn't care about what was going on. So check if you're using the right type of projector where you're going to use it, test it before, and then we'll figure it out. Test technical equipment, again, same speech. Again, the supplier had brought in different microphones. So what would happen is that they didn't bring the right sound equipment. So guess what happened? The guys talking, ah, talking. It was gonna be going, ah, it would be like the people you could hear with their earphones were going like that. It was horrendous what was going on. I mean, I felt so bad. Needless to say, I never got this client back. Even though it was not our fault, we did a great presentation. The supplier brought sleep mode, sound equipment, bad projector, but in the end, the feeling was, Luke, you screwed up. And we got blamed. We didn't get blamed. They understood it wasn't us. But the, the wow, the feeling, the impact of what it was supposed to sell was killed, and immediately they blamed the supplier, which was me. So I'm just saying, check everything that goes down, because it can really hurt you, not just with a client. It can hurt you trying to sell you're launching a new app, and you got 10 really great guys that say, I'm gonna give you a billion dollars right now, out the door, just because of a bad presentation. So be careful with that. Backups, USB, online, laptops. I am what many of my friends say, that I'm a stickler, I'm nervous all the time. I only see negativity of what will happen at these events, and I have the, the backup, basically, the background that I've seen mistakes happen like I was saying at this presentation before. So I like having at least two to three USBs with my presentation. I like having a PDF version in case the video doesn't work. I like having two different accounts, minimum, online that have it. I like having lots of backups, so there's no. Because what happens is you'll show up, I think it's the next slide, yeah, online access. What's gonna happen? You show up at an event, like Mrs. Kiev Sanat, be very careful there. Wi-Fi doesn't work in every area in that place, or sometimes you can't even find it anywhere in that place. That's why you need your online, that's why you need your USB keys. You gotta get that ready. A lot of people told me that I was, and I was like bringing two, three laptops with my team. In case their laptop doesn't work, we just plug it in. It actually did happen once. One presentation, the laptop crashed. Something happened, we unplugged it, we plugged it back into another laptop. We were back and running in like literally two minutes. If I didn't have done, done that, which my team thinks that I'm overbearing and annoying, that would have been a big mistake. I mean, that would have really would have cost us, but I said, uh-huh, I told you I was right on this one. And since then, <laughs> they do it. So now I'm telling you guys, better be safe than sorry. It's just, and rehearsals. Again, that original presentation I told you about, I learned so much in one presentation on what they're doing. These people were all out having coffee and they didn't, and they all had to show up. The meeting was starting at nine. And we were ready, we'd work 24 straight hours. We said at eight o'clock we'll be ready, you'll have 45 minutes to rehearse who goes on first, because there were several speakers. They showed up at uh, 10 minutes to nine, and then they were all arguing. No, I'm on first, no, you're next, no, I'm next. And these are all professional people. And I'm like, push more, you know, like what's, Needless to say, there was a lot of mistakes. These people were not ready, and this was their presentation. And but they were too busy having a coffee in the morning and having their cigarette outside, rather than and they left it to the last second, and it cost them dearly. Rehearsals. I'm not saying that you need to practice your speech. Just know when you're going on, know what you're talking about, so that you're not reading the screen because you don't know what you're doing, and it shows people aren't stupid. So know your material and know what you're talking about. You know your subject matter is what I just said. Know what you're doing so that even if the computer crashes or something happens, or electricity runs out, I can still keep talking. 
and I don't even need to look at the screen. You probably notice I almost don't even look at the screen. I'm just talking, and I know from one slide. I didn't even look at these slides even before I came in here today. I said, oh, there's a presentation. Let's just talk. So know your subject matter. But if you write too much, word, copy, paste, guess what? You're just reading. You don't know your subject matter. So know what the hell you're talking about. Less is more. Steve Jobs again. Even, I'm not comparing myself, same thing with me. I like having three, four words maximum per slide. This is just as to start a subject and then you speak. You talk about it, you go deep because you know your subject matter. Same thing with that client, the pharmaceutical guy. He didn't want more than two, three words, one click. When you gotta start putting a little laser pointer, you know, to go around and then we go here and then we go there, what are laser pointers really good for? Does anybody use laser pointers? Come on. <laughs> I know he's going to make. Okay, laser pointers are awesome. They're my favorite tool because I like playing with cats. <laughs> okay, that's the best thing. You just make them go nuts. That's the only good point of a laser pointer. It's like catnip. They go crazy for that kind of stuff. No, laser pointers are useless. If you have to use a laser pointer in your presentation, guess what? It's time to put it on. It's time to put your presentation on a diet. Okay, it's, it's way too heavy and it's way too much stuff. All right, we're going to test now. This is the group thing where everyone really has to try. So I want you to tell me, very, but raise your voices, please, okay? How many dots? Nine. Eight. 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 Nine. 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 Seven. Nine. It's nine. 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 Nine, like in German. <laughs> nine. It's nine. But you see the, the confusion that's going on. Okay, and now. Seven. Let's go down. It's about like one. Six. 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 All right, you see how quick it is? Why is that? The perception of the human brain cannot handle more than six objects at a time. Anything more? Six or more objects, 800% increase of understanding. The brain cannot function at more than six objects at once. The eyes grabbing it and everything. You know when I see somebody who puts on their slide and put a whole pile of stuff on there, what I tell people is I have no problems with somebody having 200 slides as long as there's two, three words per slide. What I hate is somebody has 30 slides but has a chapter on each slide. The human brain cannot comprehend it. It cannot, it won't remember it because what happens is that 90% is forgotten after 30 seconds. The main one reason before I started the company is I said, what's your biggest problem with PowerPoints? They said, I don't remember what the point was. I don't know what the point is at the end. And I'm always confused at the end. Simplify. Keep it down. Six is maximum. I would go to three points. You know those bullet points that everyone loves talking? They love showing? Start them at Go to three, go to five. Six is even too much in my view, but six is the maximum. You cannot go. If you're going to do six, one, talk about it. Two, talk about it. Three, don't put them all at once because what happens? Nobody's watching me anymore. They're reading the screen. And by the time you start talking about point number five or point number six, guess what? All of you have read it already 10 minutes before. So there's no connection. So you need to keep the connection of what's going on. Too many slides, I was just telling you, I have no problems with a ton of slides. But what I don't like is too little slides with too much information on it. Ah, oh, my favorite one, <laughs> fonts and colors. So I, I keep telling myself i got to fix that, and I always forget it's fancy, not all fanny. I keep forgetting, it's a spell check that I even forgot to do, and every time I make this presentation, I always forget about it. I used to have a friend who is a very well-known guy in this market for business. But we used to call him, I'm going to call him XYZ for now because he's very well known. Uh, we used to call it XYZ Animation Studio. It was a joke because he was a business guy, but if he had 200 slides, he would use absolutely every font, color, animation you could find possible on every slide. So there'd be like little people walking across the slides, you know, the <laughs> slides would go flying in. And it was, this was serious business. He was just, goes, oh, well, look, it's amazing. So we called him XYZ Animation Studio. That was his name because it was just hilarious how he could use everything. It's messy. 
and it's distracting. Once you start going to rainbow colors, you start going different colors, guys. I accept it if you have a business that entertains children on Saturdays. You know those places where they come in, and now let's go to this. That's great for kids, but you're all adults and you're professionals. So, what's going on? Oh, yes. Animation. Now, that's definitely going to sign that big contract because I made the fonts do that. Guaranteed, I'm going to buy that new Porsche Cayenne next week with the money I made off of this presentation. You understand what I mean? It is why it's even in PowerPoint. I think it's for board housewives that need to do a cookie recipe or something like that. You know, just now let's have some fun. Please don't do it. Put animation, I say, I think it's on. The animation has got to be very simple. Appear, keep it simple, keep it to the point. Have respect for what you're trying to sell. And if what you're trying to sell is garbage, is what I call it. If there's no substance, it's not interesting. Guess what happens? You have to put, it's like a Hollywood movie. Again, as I said, you now put more explosions, more robots, more guns, the guy running without the shirt on, you know, that's the whole point. You got to really excite people now. And there's no content in that. Fonts. Times New Roman, while it looks nice, it's not for a presentation. It's for word. Times is made. Now, serifs, I'm just saying this, I know most know. Serifs are those little little things there. That's made for easier reading. That's why when you read a book, it's usually all in serif. Fonts usually times or stuff like that. That's good, but that's for your Word document. Now, why is Word document okay now? Because if I have a huge research paper that I have to give to somebody, of course I'm going to give it in Word. I'm not going to give it in PowerPoint unless I want to keep it short in PowerPoint style to a presentation. Word, reading. Font for reading. Fonts for us, for presentations. These are just my favorites that I use. Arial, Helvetica, Calibri, or Futura, but you can pick. It's a hard square font. Easy. Why did I pick these as well? Because if I go back from Mac to PC, or one, one Mac to another Mac, or PC to another PC, these are default fonts on every computer. The worst part to do is when you have a presentation, you give it to somebody, the person says, I don't have that font. <laughs> Can you send me the font, please? How do I install the font? I don't know. Let me call IT. You know, everyone is confused. Play it simple, you know? The font ain't going to sell that new app, you know? it's. Keep it to the point. So these are mainly, especially Helvetica or um, Helvetica or Arial, those are mainly very, very simple and they're easy to read. You can pound them much bigger. So we're going to go to the top 10. Actually, we're doing not bad. So, so tip one, create a mystery to ignite curiosity. Grab them at the beginning. It's like a good novel. Do you tell everything you're going to talk about in the book at the beginning of a book? Of course not. You grab them, and then you drive them through a story. Tip two, motion creates emotions. You're not a stick. You know how to dance. Your body has joints. Use them. Use it to sell it, is what I say. Don't hide behind the podium. Be an emotion. Get people to laugh. Get people to move around. Body language. It's like I said, it speaks volumes. Express yourself genuinely and honestly. What I... That's the one thing that I'm, I'm, I'm admitting this for the first time, and it's not a part of my little speech thing. I watch so many speeches, and I do a lot, that at first I was like pretty proud of myself, you know? So I'm talking, there's an auditorium, and I'm just walking around, you know? This is fine. Everybody likes it because it's not behind. But there's something about me right now that I'm starting to really get irritated by people walking around. So I have to figure out a whole new style. Because I hate these guys. They walk, it's like back and forth. <laughs> talking, and they're just walking around. It's like watching a tennis match. It's going back and forth. So I, I need to, I got to figure out something for myself because I'm looking at this. I said, if I hate this, imagine how many other people are annoyed by me walking around. That's why I wanted a couch, actually, today, but they couldn't, they didn't, they, they said it's not in the budget, so. Uh, interact with your audience. Like I said, you know, the dots, everything. Wake them up. You know, people are falling asleep, the sunglasses, it's true, it's going to the bathroom. That guy's gone to the bathroom seven times in 15 minutes. Obviously, he's not interested in what I have to say. Avoid the podium. Please just stay away from it. 
It's, I mean, unless you're the president of the United States and Hollande is sitting beside you and you have the big thing, yes, you're not going to see Barack. So let's talk about the nuclear missile crisis going on. And that's right. I'm telling you right now, we will protect our Ukrainian friends. Never read, which I just did. Two words and I had to read it, but that's fine. Please don't read because you're just insulting the audience. People, you're just pretty much telling them all of you can't read. So I have, and they're reading, you're reading. It's just one big hooked on phonics. Basically, everyone's learning to read. This is one thing that I say, to, I used to say, but I still say to a lot of my, a lot of my uh, creative people that used to work with me, especially copywriters. It's kind of like Twitter. Twitter is 140 something characters. Say it quick, but it makes you think as you're writing. It's so easy to write. Don't say in seven what you can say in two. Sometimes one word. And it's amazing how it makes you think. The quicker you can say it, if you can say it in two or three words, put that on your screen. But it has the same impact as saying it into seven, but seven people have to read it. They don't pay attention to you. It's too long. Don't say in seven what you can say in two. That's just the saying, but put yourself through the exercise. Can I say this shorter? Can I get more to the point? My Nokia, my old Nokia, can't handle more than 60 characters. What do I say? Do you remember those old phones where you couldn't? It's not like smartphones. Mistakes will happen. You'll screw up. It's life. What do you do? Do you have fun? Do you laugh? It's fine. It's like I said, the first time I made a speech, I was so nervous. The first time it was a long, 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 long time ago. I said, listen, guys, I'm not a public speaker, so I'm probably going to make a lot of mistakes. But if I do, let's all laugh together. And immediately the crowd kind of started laughing a little bit. I said, good, but it made me calm down when I just said, we're here for a discussion. And since then, I've never been, now I don't care. I love speaking in front of anybody. It's, it's fun. Anyone who is brave enough to listen to my mouth go on. Do the checklist. Please do the checklist. There's nothing worse than all those weekends and nights of work. Only to have the sleep mode ruin your entire presentation. People running in the back. The fonts bumping to the next line. The graph not working properly. It's horrible. Have some fun. I mean, it's not, it's, we're not going to the dentist here. I mean, we're just, we're talking, we're having fun. I mean, it's it's the overall point. So what's the next slide? Ah, oh, that's it. It's over. So hopefully, if nobody slept, I don't think so. There's a lot. So in short, there's a lot. This is just, I know more, most of what I said is the basics. I know that you say, oh, I knew this already. Why did I come on a Saturday to listen to this guy? Because you know what? Because you don't do it. It's as simple as that. You claim that this is easy, but nobody does it. They write, they write. Next thing you know, they got 150 slides. You don't even know where you're going because when you don't know where you're going, guess what you're doing? Slide 75. And therefore, I'm going to read the next three lines because people don't know. There's just too much going on. Nobody likes making PowerPoint. Nobody likes looking at them. When it gets too long, this is getting boring by slide 30. Let's put some colors in there. Let's put a cat running across. Let's put a video of something. You'd be surprised, but it's like a, it's like a domino effect that what goes on. So don't say in seven weeks. You can say in two, and you'd be surprised. You could even have 20 slides. And there's one thing. I don't know. Did I put it? No, I didn't put it. There's one slide that I wanted to put in there, but I didn't put it. There's the 30-20-10 rule. This is by Guy Kawasaki. I'm a very big fan. I mean, if you look on Google, basically, Guy Kawasaki, he was working at Apple. He's a very big guy, but now he's a big investor in, in uh, Silicon Valley. He has the 30-20-10 the rule, which I like the, the thinking behind it. What is it? 30-point slide, 30-point uh, text. So you go as big. People like putting it at 10. Put it at 30, 20, or 20 points. 30 is a bit exaggerated. 30-point text. Uh, 20 slides, 10 minutes. Why? You walk into an investor's place. Hi, I've got this new magical clicker. You know, it checks my audience if they like me or not, blah, 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 does everything. And I want $2 million or $10 million to buy into this. The guy is late. He's an investor. You want his money? That's as simple as that. They're always late. By the way, they come in. Some are on time and they respect you. Some other ones have heard so many bad pitches all week. And that's their job. You come in, the person's late, had a fight with his wife in the morning, was late, stuck in traffic, road rage, whatever you want. Guy goes, listen, you got 10 minutes, get it done. What happens? Person says, I got it. 
85 slides. I got big graphs. I got everything. Person starts panicking. They start going. They're reading the slides and everything. The guy's he's losing his patience because that million dollar deal could be right there for you to launch your dream. You're going to be the guy like Mark, the next Mark Zuckerberg, vanishing away. And then you try and do it all in 10 minutes, what you should have had for 30 to 50 minutes. I'll teach you a small trick. The 30, 20, 10 rule is you should be able to present that in 10 minutes. Don't say in seven what you can say in two. What happens at that point is that if you hook them and they like what they see, guess what happens? Guy says, do you have more information on this? Can you cancel my meetings? I want to speak to Luke a little bit longer because I want to get into it. I once had a pitch with a client who, which was Tienka which at that time, it was very strict 45 minute presentation. They liked what we had to talk so much because we were ready in less than 20 minutes we were finished our pitch. They ended up keeping us for almost three hours and we won the pitch because they really, they felt the value of wanting to talk to us deeper. When you try and cram all that very short into a very short amount of time, it just confuses everybody. The wild feeling is gone, enjoying yourself is gone, everyone is stressed. So 30 point slide, bring it down to 20. 30 point is very big, but keep it very, very big. Don't say in seven what you can say in two. 20, 20 slides maximum. 10 minutes to do to do your presentation. Done and done. If you've got quality, they will keep you or they'll ask you to come back again. If there's no quality, at least you got to the point you didn't waste their time, but they might say, the idea is garbage, but Luke, we like you a lot. Come up with any other ideas, we'll invest in you, just like I read about the guys from Reddit yesterday. So keep it short, keep it to the point, less is more, as I was saying. Kenyans. <laughs> Am, is everyone going to give me a really damn good feedback on this? Luke is awesome. Luke is great. Um, is there any questions? I know I've covered a lot, but I'm wondering. Yes. Uh, can you advise something regarding scientific?